All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Andrew Workfitz. I'm the Town of Penfield Recreation Director. And um, as all of you know and are here for uh, a wonderful reason is we're having our second community input session um, here today to talk about our Parks and Rec Master Plan. Um, now there's gonna be a presentation from myself, just an overview of our master plan for our Parks and Rec. Um, we're gonna then have a presentation for a new rec center study uh, that will be put into our Parks and Rec master plan. And then our last presentation uh, will be on a Shadow Pines uh, bike project. So all of these things, rec related, parks related, looking to fold into our Parks and Rec master plan. Um, after the three presentations, uh, we're looking to have breakout sessions where uh, people that are here uh, can go to the separate tables, ask the different groups uh, specific questions, have those kind of conversations. So at least for the presentations, we'll try to get those uh, through as quickly as possible, uh, provide our information, and then there's always um, after the fact you can come and discuss with us. But thank you so much for being here. Um, so really, uh, our Parks and Rec Master Plan Update Committee, I wanted to start off by just thanking, um, having a wonderful group. Uh, we started to meet in the fall of 2023. Uh, we've had a bunch of different meetings, um, really a lot of good discussions with our committee, uh, so we're very thankful, and I just wanna really recognize the people that are here today and also the ones that aren't. So again, I'm Andrew Erkfitz. Um, from the Recreation Department, we have Pam Gerace and Sabrina Renner. Um, from our Parks Department, Department. We have Tim Masterton, who's our Parks Foreman. Uh, he's here this evening, so thank you, or today. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Linda Cole, who's a former town board member who started in 2023 with us, has done many master plans uh, for the Parks and Rec. We're very thankful that she started um, and even into her early months of retirement is staying on as the Parks and Rec uh, Committee. So thank you, Linda, uh, for all your insight. Uh, Linda Teglish, who's on the current town board, uh, is a member. Uh, Don Hoyler, who's a member of this committee, the Penfield Trails Committee, and our Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Man of many hats, thank you, Don, uh, for all that you do and all the committees you serve on. Uh, Jim Stamfer, who's not here. Uh, John Schmelk, who I believe is here. Uh, thank you, John. Um, Niraj, who is not here. Alex DeBella, and then William Latumsky. Um, I also want to mention we do have our town supervisor, Jeff Leenhouts. Uh, thank you so much for being here as well. Um, so really looking from the Parks and Rec side of things, um, we're, we're updating our master plan right now, uh, but I did want to highlight on really just, you can connect with Penfield Parks and Rec anytime. Um, so we really, we wanna hear from you. We wanna have as much interaction just because we do a five-year master plan doesn't mean that we only wanna hear from you every five years. Um, so the different uh, options that you can connect with us is uh, our main office hours are 8.30 to 4.30 Monday through Friday. Um, really for our recreation hours in our building, it's 8.30 to 9 p.m. over at our current community center. And then on weekends, it's eight to three where we have staff in the building. Um, those evenings and weekend times, we've only added staff since last May, um, really to enhance, again, customer service. When people are in the building, if people have questions registering for programs or reserving facilities, we have someone now at night and on weekends to help assist residents. So uh, that's something that came out of our previous master plan and we're very thankful that the, the town and the town board agreed uh, to add that in for our community center right now. Uh, our phone number's up there, 340-8655. You can call any time, um, whether it's a registration question or input, um, we'd just love to hear from you. And then the easiest email for us is recreation at penfield.org. Our website's penfieldrec.org. You can register for programs. You can reserve facilities, which we have our enclosed lodges and open shelters. Um, we have all of the calendar of our programs and events. Uh, you can register to be on our e-news just from our recreation side of things and from the town that I know come out monthly. And then we have a Facebook account, Town of Penfield uh, Recreation Department, where you can like and follow up to date as many of our um, programs, events, updates, and things like that are put out onto social media. 
And then the town's website, penfield.org. Um, and that is gonna be the main website where if you wanna access the presentation from tonight, or today, excuse me, from our previous first session, um, any of the materials uh, that are in the back that are gonna be presented are all on the town website. You just have to click on the area where, I believe it's on the main page, at the top of the page, front and center, it says uh, Park and Rec Master Plan. Um, so one change since our last session is we now have our community input survey. And this is something where our committee looks at this is the biggest piece um, when we're looking to update our master plan is this survey. We have about 39 questions I think in there. It's a little bit more than our previous um, community survey. But again, uh, we took our last uh, master plan in 2019 uh, and really expanded on some of the questions that we asked before, uh, kind of seeing the trends uh, and things like that since 2019. Um, so there is um, a QR code if you've got your phone on you and you haven't taken that. Um, we've gotten some flyers up here. They're all around our town buildings. Um, but we're planning on having this be open until the end of March, probably around like the 22nd. Um, but lo just looking at our current survey submissions, we have over 650 and I checked that on Thursday. Um, so we're assuming that it's more. We had about 640 for our 2019 uh, survey. So already with a month left to go, uh, we're already ahead of the game in terms of where we were in 2019 with submissions. Uh, so again, I cannot stress enough, I'll probably say it too many times today, uh, but really this community input is what we're looking for. Uh, we wanna hear from the community on all of these different projects and really just everything Parks and Rec uh, master plan driven. So please go to the survey and fill it out online. Again, it's available on the town website. Uh, click on the master plan section or use the QR code. Um, so just a little background about our master plan process. It's updated every five years, so our last one was done in 2019. And um, I'm really gonna read word for word um, this little excerpt that I took out of our 2019 master plan that kind of just brings everything together about why we do this process. So the Town of Penfield's Park and Rec master plan update is intended to help meet the needs of current and future residents by positioning Penfield to build on the community's unique parks and recreation assets and identify new opportunities. The citizen-driven master plan establishes a clear direction to guide staff, committees, and elected officials in their efforts to enhance the community's parks and recreation programs, services, and facilities. And again, at the end of the day, you know, speaking mainly for the recreation department, um, we use the master plan often. Uh, goal setting on a yearly basis and even on a seasonal basis. What are the types of programs that we're offering? What trends are we seeing from the previous master plan? So again, as much input uh, as we can get from the community is just gonna help us be a little bit closer to meeting the mark with what our community needs are. Our previous master plans um, before 2019 were done using COTS and Associates, uh, Land and Recreation Planning and Design Group. Um, really starting in 2019, um, the town looked at what is our master plan press process? We're having a consultant come out and do this. And the decision was made to really just have it be more citizen driven. Uh, so we stopped using the consultant and um, everything came out of kind of just grassroots starting from the town, getting as many residents as possible, having more community input surveys and things like that rather than have it be consultant driven. Um, so we were able to save some money back in 2019 um, just having it kind of be done in house. Um, and during that 2019 uh, master plan, the committee identified four dimensions of parks and recreation. Uh, one is Penfield people, one is Penfield parks, properties and trails, one is Penfield Recreation Programs, and the last is Penfield Rec Indoor Facilities. Uh, when we came to the 2024 update, we really looked at these four dimensions and thought that it, we're never gonna encompass everything in Parks and Recreation. It is super vast and there, it, it's a wonderful thing that's about Parks and Rec is there's so many different avenues that people recreate, how they program, how we can program to offer things for the community. Uh, but really we thought these four things kind of represented uh, the large pieces that we wanted to look at uh, for the town of Penfield. 
So looking specifically at dimension number one when we're looking at this update for Penfield people, it's really reviewing population trends, um, gathering information from the most recent census. You know, was there increases or decreases in community population? Uh, you really, what's the makeup of our community? What are the demographics? Again, a lot of that can be seen from the census, but we also wanna hear different needs from the community for the types of people, adaptive sort of needs, things like that that, that aren't in the census. Uh, so again, that's gonna come from the uh, survey. Uh, and then that uh, support and assistance. When looking at dimension number two uh, for Penfield Parks, Properties and Trails, I know we have a presentation tonight uh, about Shadow Pines Bike Project, which is very specific to trails and parks. Uh, but really, we're looking at all of our parks as a whole. Uh, what's our inventory changes since 2019? Where have we added fields? Where have we added bathrooms, trails, things like that? Where have we decreased playgrounds, other opportunities? Um, Kind of to highlight some of them, we have three brand new rectangle fields uh, that are gonna be open in April. Well, April or May, depending on the weather as I look at the parks foreman in the back. Um, but really, we've already seen from our sport groups over the years that there is a definite need based on school fields and rectangle fields with the town. Uh, so building these three new fields is helping us to be able to rest some fields potentially in the future, which overall benefits uh, kind of the sports, uh, youth sports community here here in Penfield. Um, and then large Shadow Pines property. Uh, back when we did the 2019 master plan update, uh, there was already a committee that was kind of community driven looking at the Shadow Pines property as a whole. Um, so it, we made a decision in 2019 to really hold off on giving any recommendations because there was already a community um, organization or committee that was making those recommendations. So we're looking to expand on what's been done, what that committee proposed, and then uh, plans like the Shadow Pines bike project, um, our disc golf project that's gone in, um, pickleball and things like that will be added into this master plan plan. Uh, another large thing that we're looking at is connectivity of our trail system to parks and locations. Um, that could mean a lot of our standalone parks uh, where we, we do offer a lot of trails, but a lot of them are very similar when you go to our different parks. The type of trail, the type of terrain. You go to a parking lot, you do a circle or two, um, and then you're back at the parking lot and you can leave. And that's a wonderful option to have. But I think one of the things we're looking at is how can we connect different parks, different trail systems uh, to be able to better serve the entire community. So if you don't just wanna go to one park or use one sort of trail, can you go to another park where maybe there's other options um, for the types of trails uh, that you can get into? And uh, I'll leave it uh, to Adam later to discuss the different types of trail systems uh, that we're really kind of starting to dive into, uh, mainly at Shadow Pines right now that you'll see with the bike project. But again, as a master plan, I think we're looking uh, not just at Shadow Pines, but all of our parks and trail systems when it comes to you know how are we serving the community best. Uh, and then that brings us to multi-use trails. Um, when we're looking at the different trail systems that we have here, um, a lot of them are pro dog walking, pro hiking. Um, again, you show up to the park, you do a loop and you come back. Wonderful thing to offer to the community. There's health benefits, there's everything, there's nature. Um, but again, does that serve the entire community as a whole? Are there different options? Uh, are there different routes that can be taken? Um, if there's not sidewalks in places, could a trail system kind of make up for that at different parks to connect our different areas around town? So again, uh, we love to hear the feedback. Um, we've got a trails committee, we've got a parks and rec advisory committee and a master plan. So we certainly have a lot of committees that are already going to be looking into it, but um, just some fun stuff uh, to kind of look towards the future. Uh, for our third dimension, uh, it's Penfield Rec Program. So as the Rec Director, uh, I can say um, it's kind of weird that we're always looking for more work to do. Uh, we want to offer more programs for the community. Um, as you'll see with our Rec Center study, when we're looking at some of the details, some of it is facility driven. You know, We can only offer so many programs in our current facility, um, and that's really um, kind of spurred the Recreation Department for years to look at other opportunities, to uh, look at partnerships um, with outside organizations that may have their own facilities so we can at least offer programs to the town of Penfield, um, but not just at our current facility. And uh, 
I can't thank the Recreation Department enough. Uh, you know, when you look at our enrollment numbers, uh, I believe last year in 2023, we're at 90% of our programs running. Uh, so let's say we offered 100 programs, 90 of them ran, which mean we got enough people to enroll into that program to have it run. And I think that speaks to the master plan process, how we connect to the community, but also for the rec staff. Um, we only have a couple rooms in our current facility, uh, but we have parks, we have fields, and we have a lot of different kind of partnerships that we have uh, with community groups. So we're offering as many programs as possible, but please don't think that we can't offer more. We want to do more in the community. Uh, so a lot of it's just updating our current trends and program data. You know, again, that 90% I think is a wonderful thing. I'd like to be able to say we'll sustain it, but it's, again, feedback from the community to offer programs that are up to date and, and what they want. Um, of course, there's always financials in there. You know, what's the revenue we're bringing in? What's the expense that goes out? I, I think we're doing a great job. We were over our revenue last year by $100,000 and we were under our expense. So uh, that's just an easy way to say, we made more money and we spent a little bit less than projected. So we're very thankful for that. But is there places that we could do better? Is there places where we could spend a little bit more money um, and offer a little bit more uh, cheap uh, community services and programs out there? And again, you know, program interests, planning for future programming. If you take that community input survey, uh, there's a lot of questions in there really looking for what you as the community and residents are looking in for rec programs that we offer. Um, again, we will never be able to fully show all the different types and categories and things like that that we offer through rec programs, but really we, we offer everything for all ages. Certainly there's, there's more programs for certain areas, but that's based on kind of what we hear. Um, but really if at any age reach out to us, we'll, we'll find programming for you. And then our categories, I listed the majority and the main ones that we really offer in our brochure, but half the time we, we get a program and we're like, wow, this could be this sort of category, but it also could be this sort of. So uh, there's never gonna be enough categories where we can label things. Um, so certainly if there are more ideas for programs, uh, categories, things like that, reach out to the rec department. You're never gonna hear a no, it's uh, how can we help to try and run this program. So our Plan uh, dimension number four is our indoor facility. And there'll be a presentation after this uh, from plan architecture, uh, really showing, you know, taking a deep dive look into what a new rec center facility could be for the town of Penfield. Um, we're updating our recreation facility data. Um, we're busting at the seams in terms of utilizing our current facility. Um, whether it's registering and we try to pack as many programs into it as possible, but we also understand that there's a, a large need for community organizations to use our facility for reservation space. If you are a community organization or a resident, our um, rooms at the community center are currently offered free. Uh, so you can reserve a room. Um, if it's a high risk activity, we have to talk about insurance and all those fun things. But again, we also understand that that is a need for organizations that we work with uh, to offer events and programs. Uh, we know there's a shortage out there and there's a large need, uh, especially coming after COVID and in some places kind of losing uh, where they met for years. So we're updating our data, but really it's gonna show that our buildings used the majority of the time for either programming and or reservations from the public. Um, again, a study by um, Plan Architects is coming up next. Um, but before that, I really wanted to give some background information about our current community center. Uh, we'd like to say hopefully all of our residents come to our community center, um, but at the same time, if you're not aware, um, our current facility was constructed in 1953. Originally, it was an elementary school for the school district, and we purchased the, the facility and remodeled it in 1985. Um, we do have our library, our rec department, and our town court as a part of our community center. The total square footage of the community center is 43,000 square feet. The library occupies just over 28,000 of that 43. And the town court operates uh, right around 4,500. So that leaves the recreation department's total space with about 11,000, uh, but when we're just looking at program space, which is what we're offering to the community, um, it's 8,000 square feet. So 
again, when we're starting to look at the rec center and you're gonna see the presentation when they're talking about numbers, um, I think we're doing a heck of a job in 8,000 square feet to offer as much as we can to the community. Um, we can continue to offer as many programs as possible and continue to what we do is 8,000 square feet. But the exciting part about this when we're looking at a new rec center is what can we offer with more space? Whether it's 20,000 square feet, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 square feet. Again, this is where the input from the community is gonna come in uh, to see what we can kind of put and where we can put it. Um, but I think that important number of 8,000 square feet and four total rooms, a gymnasium, uh, which is 3,700 square feet, a community room, 2,500 square feet, a conference room, which is just 500, and then a senior lounge. There's really four rooms that we have programs for in our current building. Uh, we work with the library as they have the Brayman Room. We have a wonderful relationship with our library. We enjoy being in the same building. We offer similar services uh, in our building. Uh, but when we're looking at just the rec center, and this is only for the study right now, we're not breaking ground, we're not getting approval or anything like this. Um, it's purely for data and master plan. Um, when we're looking at 8,000 square feet, um, the wonderful thing is what can we offer in a larger facility? And we have tons and millions of ideas of what we can do, but really it's gonna come from the community on what this new rec center um, could be. Uh, so when we're looking at our next steps, uh, there's gonna be two more presentations, one for a rec center study, one for Shadow Pines mountain bike project, and then we're gonna have some breakout sessions. Um, but the biggest thing that I'll leave, and again, there's QR codes up here if you haven't already taken the community input survey, uh, please come up, um, take that survey as we want your input. Um, our master plan updates cannot happen without community engagement. That's the largest thing that we did when we moved from being from a consultant to now to uh, kind of committee and community driven. So please provide your updates and input. Uh, we want to hear it from everyone for as much as possible. I included all of the ways that you can connect with us. If you don't feel like the survey is an option for you, send an email to recreation at penfield.org. Uh, it'll come to me. I will share it with our Parks and Rec Master Plan Committee. Uh, really, we're looking to kind of wrap up um, the survey information, gathering data at the end of March. We'll probably most likely take April, potentially May, uh, to come up with our different narratives, put it into the master plan, and then present it to the town board for final approval. Uh, if you're interested in seeing previous Parks and Rec master plans, they're also available on that same section under uh, Parks and Rec master plan. Specifically, our 2019 would be the best one to look at. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, the next presentation, just give us a couple minutes. Feel free to talk amongst yourself, but we will have plan architecture. I know Cortland will come up uh, with his thing. So thank you again, everyone, for being here. Just give us a couple minutes. Thank you all for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, it's a great day, but um, we're in here going to be talking about the rec center. Um, so my name is Cortland Knopp. I am an architect with Plan Architectural Studio. Uh, last time, Chris Lopez, who's the principal at the one of the principals at the office, gave the presentation. He couldn't be here today, so I'm just kind of filling in for him. Um, I've actually never given a community presentation before, so um, I'm happy to be doing it in front of you all. <laughs> so, uh, by a show of hands, uh, who was here last time at the end of January? A few of you, most of you, looks about half of you. Um, so some of this stuff's going to seem redundant, but uh, for those of you who weren't here, uh, I'm going to kind of be going quick. So if you could, um, if you have any questions or if I jump through something too quick, please stop back at the boards. Um, we'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, so reiterating what Andrew was saying, we really wanted this rec center to be uh, something for the Penfield residents, for the community. And so we tried our best to fold everything that we were hearing from the rec department staff and Andrew into the study to make it a place for Penfield and for the people of Penfield. Um, so I'll just, I'll read uh, just a synopsis of how we got to this point. In the summer of 2022, we were asked to perform a study for the potential of a new community recreation center. This study was put on hold in February of 2023 by the town board, and as of this winter, it's been reinstated. 
Um, it's anticipated that the study will be completed uh, in a few months, um, so early 2024. Working closely with Penfield's Recreation Director, Andrew Erkbitz, and based on program information provided by the Recreation Department, an initial concept was developed to be potentially located on the north end of the town hall site, so this site, um, also known as Veterans Memorial Park, on the north end, so th there's some open soccer fields near the Dolomite Lodge. So on the screen, you'll see the uh, Town of Penfield official town map with Veterans Memorial Park highlighted. This is the study site. We also looked at uh, potentially having it at Rothfuss Park, or uh, we considered Shadow Pines, but we, we landed on Veterans Memorial Park because it is the geographic center of Penfield, and uh, it's close to the town hall, so it's nice to have your municipal services in the same place. And um, the rec department also uses some other features on this site as well, um, like the amphitheater and the Dolomite Lodge is there also. So it, it kind of just made sense to put, it, to put it here. The next slide is a blow up of Veterans Memorial Park and you can see the yellow box is, is where we studied uh, to have the rec center. Um, this area is underutilized. It's some soccer fields or some rectangular fields. Um, it's also close to the road there, so bringing utilities into the facility would be simpler. And there's also a couple of shared parking lots, so we wouldn't have to build as much parking, um, which I think made a lot of sense. So um, the next slide is an immediate site plan, and we position the building based on um, Richard Louv's nature principle. And so maintaining, bringing the, putting the building near the access drive and the shared parking, like I said, but then that allows the views and everything to be maintained out to the forest and out to the trails. Um, and so it, we also show these red and blue lines show that the existing trails on the site, um, and we actually have the town, or I'm sorry, the, uh, um, Veterans Memorial Park trail system shown with the facility, so you can see that. Um, so you're thinking, why the nature principle? So I'll just, I'll read you the nature principles philosophy uh, by Richard Louv. Tapping into the restorative powers of the natural world can boost mental acuity and creativity, promote health and wellness, build smarter and more sustainable businesses, communities and economies, and ultimately strengthen human bonds. Um, so you might be wondering why. So connecting the building to the exterior through views, views and trails. We also envision this to be a recreational hub for Penfield. So not only recreating inside, but getting people to, you know, come to meet at the facility and then encouraging outdoor recreation. So the next slide is that the Veterans Memorial Park trail map so you can see the blue and the dotted lines and the red of how it can it integrates with the trails um, making it a a hub for the trails so um, moving more in turn in in terms of the inside of the building we um, organize the building based on the blue zones philosophy so uh, um, I'll read what that is the Blue Zones philosophy is derived from the work of Dan Butner, a National Geographic fellow who identifies regions around the world where people reportedly live extraordinary long and happy lives. So if you see on, on the next slide is the four basic tenets of the Blue Zone philosophy. So connect, move, eat, and outlook. Connect socially, move through physical activities, um, eat better, so through nutritional education and having the right outlook through education and, and finding uh, or having a purpose. So on the next slide, you'll see how we took that Blue Zones philosophy and applied it to the floor plan. So the blue areas are the areas that we can connect through social activities. So the lobby, the commons, senior center, rec offices. The yellow is moving with physical activities, so things like a gym, an elevated track, fitness and dance studio, instruction and stretching areas. The teal, um, the bottom right hand corner of the right hand plan is nutrition. So things like cafe, a demonstration kitchen, the pantry, uh, a commercial kitchen, exterior raised planting beds. 
And then the green, which is in the top left, is having the right outlook through education. So we're proposing uh, six multi-purpose rooms that can be divided or combined. It could be two multi-purpose rooms, it could be four and one, it could be, however the rec department plans on programming those, they could see, uh, you know, they could have the flexibility to do so. The next slide is some stats. So, um, like I said before, we're estimating that the study be completed in early, early this year, in the next couple months. Um, the building right now in this study concept phase is about 45,000 square feet, so it's you know, roughly six times as big as the space that is there now. Um, and the anticipated cost projection between 21 and 25 million. Now, we're still, we're working with Chase Construction to put together a more detailed cost estimate, which will be folded into the study and part of the master plan. So, um, for those of you here last time, this is the biggest development that we, or the biggest changes that were made. So we started putting material selections together and um, some more details, like you can see the entrance element and the trellis. So the, the brick mass is the administration portion, portion and the demonstration kitchen. Um, we chose brick because this ties into the town hall. It'd be part of the site, so it, it kind of has that municipal build, building feel. And then the larger, darker mass with the sloped roof, that is the multi-purpose rooms in the gymnasium. And um, it's a simple barn-like structure that is, is native to Penfield. And it's also a very similar um, language to the Dolomite Lodge, even though it's a different, it's much larger than that, but it's a, you know, it's a gable roof. Um, and it kind of ties in that way. And so our philosophy here is using natural materials that are durable, like wood, brick, metal, and concrete. So our hope is that it lasts a long time, but also getting back to the nature principle, using nature to influence the material selection. Um, and then we defined the entrance element with wood to, to draw you into the building. And then you can see there's a trellis up on the, the roof there, which we're proposing incorporating agrivoltaics, um, which is a method of, of farming that shades the plants during high noon, but allows sun to get in. I, just based on basic research, there's a pollinator farm on Watson Hulbert Road. They grow flowers through this method. So it's, it's a pretty interesting, and we have some diagrams and everything on, in the back if you're uh, interested in wanting to talk more about that. The next rendering is a view from the east. So you can see the, that there's a canopy, you can see that brick mass again, and uh, you can see how the views from the gym and the track really look out to the forest beyond. And then those three vertical windows there would be a, the commons and lobby area that also kind of brings that nature into the building. Um, the next rendering is from the interior lobby. So you can see those three vertical windows. You can really see how the natural materials are influencing it and, and most everything else is uh, a neutral material. So using the natural materials is that nature principle philosophy again as the accent. And then, uh, so like for example, the wood, which would be a multimedia wall the grass looking carpet and like a stone slate looking tile, really letting those natural materials um, speak for themselves. The next um, rendering is the upper lobby area. So same kind of thing here. I think it's worth noting that the inside loop of the track looks down into the lobby there, uh, connects the spaces, makes it feel part of the same facility or part of the same area. And then you can also see, catch a glimpse of that trellis in the exterior raised garden area. Um, and then we show a green track to make it look like grass. Um, the next rendering is in the gym. And similar ideas here, you can really get a feel of how the windows looking to the east look out to the forest. Um, and then we're showing a multimedia wall in the gym, which could be, it could just be media that's playing while people are playing pickleball or basketball. 
It could be a community uh, movie night, or it could be um, you know anything that the rec department sees fit. But it's kind of just like a large. It could be a larger gathering area for larger events. Um, but again, just bringing the outside inside, and just trying to push that philosophy home. The next view is of the lower gym. Um, so same kind of thing. This one shows the divider down. Uh, it could be two half courts. It could be, a, or it could be a full court. Um, but similarly, you get you see the green and the blue uh, looking out the windows. So just bringing the outside inside. Um, and so, if you go to the next slide, there. So the um, lastly, I think it's important to remember that the blue zones philosophy. So move, connect eat, and um, I forget the last one, it's on here, and having the right outlook. I think it's important to, to realize the inspiration behind the design. Um, and we just, again, want this to be something for the community, for the residents. And uh, if you have any feedback, we'd love to talk with you. So uh, please come on back and have a conversation with us. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, so I definitely want to thank uh, Cortland, Chris, uh, Aaron, Mark, who's here as well um, from Plan Architecture. Again, uh, going back to what I said in the beginning about the Parks and Rec Master Plan, um, in 2019 when we did away with a consultant uh, to save some money, uh, I'm very thankful for the town board uh, who did approve us working with such a, a wonderful group uh, to come up uh, with this. Again, purely for our master plan, um, but if you look at our previous master plans for years and years and years, um, the continuing trend was that we heard uh, that the town of Penfield needed a new rec center. And it was a wonderful short paragraph saying the community needs to do one right away. And uh, it was wonderful. We got that uh, kind of information year after year. Uh, so for the town board to come and approve uh, to take a little bit deeper of a dive um, to look and to have this go into our master plan is huge. Uh, in no way from what you just saw is what it's going to be. That's the other piece of this master plan. We've definitely taken, uh, there's been a lot of time to move forward and look at previous master plans and um, working with the group has uh, been great. Uh, it seems like we're all on the same page trying to do the right thing for the community. But again, what's gonna drive this is community input. We wanna hear from you. Just because you just saw the renderings or go back there doesn't mean that things can't be changed, can't be added. And that's the great part of this uh, kind of being folded into our master plan is that we can still gather that information, put it into narratives out there so that if and when the town does ever um, look at a new facility, uh, we could look at least again from the recreation side of things, not, not from the entire with the library and courts and things like that. Uh, if we do look at a specific new rec center, um, what are other amenities that could be added potentially? What are you looking for as residents? Uh, would you see, like to see the library and the rec stay together? You know, I, I'd like to say the town court is probably pretty obvious that you you would prefer not to have that with a with a library or rec. But certainly, there's policies and procedures in place that we currently have uh, to make that work. But um, you know, having the library and the rec together is that something you want to continue? Um, if not, obviously, changes would be made in terms. Of of uh, space and where we can fit a large building like that, but also uh, financial as well. But again, it's just uh, as much information that we can get from the community uh, on what we currently have that we're looking at, but um, what we can add to it as well. So again, uh, take the survey online. There's a bunch of different questions specifically based to the indoor facility uh, to add to it uh, on all of your opinions. So uh, thank you again to Plan Architecture for all that you did. Um, our next presentation will be from Further Trail Services with Adam, uh, and we'll get that up and running in about a minute. Uh, so feel free to talk amongst yourself. Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah, similarly, um, this presentation is going to be a little overlap with last time, and then we're going to build on it. Uh, the arc of the presentation today is we're going to talk a little bit of trail theory again. Um, then we'll touch on some of the survey results as they came back from the online survey. 
We're going to talk about how those are informing the goals and updates to the goals from the previous master planning process as it, as it relates to trails. And then we're going to get into some of the initial analysis and the observations from both the data analysis and the field observations and incorporate some of those with some of the feedback from the stakeholder inter interviews. And then ultimately we're going to get into some of the possible recommendations. So where is, where is all of that data steering the possible recommendations as they could be uh, incorporated into the draft plan? So, so further trails, uh, further trail services, we help facilitate uh, the development of community focused and destination worthy trails. And it's important to be simultaneously community focused and serve the needs of the local community but it's also important to look at the entire potential of the terrain and look to the future and think about what aspirationally could we achieve for not only our current needs, but try to look forward to the future. And, um, so further trail services, working for the conservation of enjoyment and enjoyment of natural resources through the sustainable development of trail-based recreation that enriches lives. I have a background in local trail advocacy. I'm a former consultant and contractor with the International Mountain Bicycling Association. I've done trail projects and multiple trail projects in 10 different states, mostly in the southeast, even out to Utah. And further was started, I returned home to increase local capacity, working with organizations like Genesee Regional Off-Road Cyclists and local municipalities to improve and increase trail infrastructure. So the goal is more and better trails. So project understanding. So the town of Penfield seeks to develop a written plan and graphical maps depicting the potential for natural surface trail infrastructure at Shadow Pines. It's primarily focused on mountain bikes. That's why we're calling it the mountain biking trail project, but it is, there's a heavy shared use component. So the, the goal is to identify um, potential and trail recommendations that serve a broad range of users and interest types. So the resulting plan will formalize the vision and goals, and some of that we'll touch on today. It's gonna to communicate the needs and benefits of this type of work and these types of projects. It's gonna illustrate the project potential, allow for informed decision making, so if approvals are needed, what's it gonna cost? What's the, what are the phasing recommendations? Who is it gonna serve? All that sort of stuff. Um, it's going to support those approvals, it's going to enable permitting, it's going to help empower fundraising, all that good stuff. So trail theory, why trails? As we touched on last time, community desire was expressed and there's need for this type of facility. Um, and then it was ultimately incorporated into the last master planning recommendations by BME Associates. Trails themselves, they're cost effective facilities. They're great land management strategies, whether you're attempting to conserve land from development um, or whether you're trying to protect habitat, trails can be low impact development that um, just helps serve a variety of different strategies. Um, they support diverse users, they promote health and wellness, they increase the economic vitality of a region by making it a more attractive place to visit and live and they strengthen communities overall. Diverse users, so as we talked, as I just mentioned, um, shared use trails project at heart, even though it's mountain biking focused, and all those different users, even within the mountain biking world, there are a lot of different types of users out there and what they're looking for from their trails that give them that self-actualization and that, that um, the experiences that they're seeking. So experience-based design, tries to get at identifying the many different reasons why people are drawn to trails, whether it be things like uh, they just need pure access. So some of the recommendations will focus on site accessibility, both for able-bodied people and folks with disabilities. Um, some people are looking for adventure. Some people want nature immersion, as, as referenced back there from the nature principle. Um, a lot of different reasons. And so we weigh all of those and the survey was helpful for trying to identify some of the reasons why people are looking to enjoy trails. But the bottom line is everybody is seeking a sense of flow. And sense of flow, mountain bikers talk about it a lot. What it is is it's the correlation of the challenge at hand and one's ability to rise to that challenge in a synchronistic way. So 
things get hard, you rise to it, you feel good, you get through it, you feel like a hero, right? And that's really good for people's spirit. It's good for their bodies and minds. It's great for so having social experiences together. If When people can find those um, synchronistic, optimal ways of being, everybody wins. So trail types. Uh, we got into this last time. I won't really dive back into it. But planning and design simply, it helps to provide for all those different users and all the different experience goals that they have with different trails that support those different preferences. So different trail types. You see the one up top is more of a backcountry type of trail. It's very primitive. It's more like a deer path. And some people just want crave that nature immersion in the natural world that's left relatively untouched. And then other people want more of a hardened surface play type of facility. And there's a real spectrum in between, right? So trail types can be anything from pathways and roads to the traditional type of trail that you see up top to a very mountain bike optimized type of trail. And that incorporates things like grade reversals, uh, in-slope turns, it could be rollers and jumps. Uh, gravity trails could be smooth and flowy, could be textured and chunky. Mountain bike optimized trails could be chunky. So even within all these different trail types, there are subtypes that can be identified. Uh, and then bike parks, like that one you see on the bottom there. Um, and that's just a portion of what bike parks could offer. So when thinking about the types of trails that could fit and the types of needs and uses and preferences that are out there, it's really important to think about the recreation setting. And this is a Bureau of Land Management concept that looks at landscape level design in an effort to help classify the recreation setting and then identify management, corresponding management techniques so that facility designs and uses should fit the land and support the outcome goals. So you're trying to get people moving, you're trying to provide access, you're trying to provide a sense of adventure. Um, all of these things in, go into the old data hopper and, and they help inform the direction for the choices that are made. So the landscape is going to present certain opportunities, but then how do you make those um, jive with what people are looking for? So on, on the one side, on the left side, you'll see a lot of hardened surface, right? So you've got a pathway bi-directional with the line. It's great for, um, and then Robert here has been down to Bentonville. He's seen stuff like this. Um, great for uh, active transportation, urban connectivity. And then you've also got options that are a little more rustic, but yet heavily hardscaped with this type of pavering work. You got walling and, and uh, paver stones, and they, that functions as a gateway to a different type of trail experience. By using this type of design, users can self-select. It's a great way of helping set precedents, um, set expectations for what the types of trail experiences people are going to um, encounter if they go one way or the other. At the full other end of the spectrum, you've got this primitive trail here. That's a backcountry environment, right? So Shadow Pines, in this instance, is in the spectrum, it's going to lean more towards the urban, rural, front country type of context. But there are some beautiful stands of woods in there. There are some hemlocks. And when you're back in there, you kind of forget that you're in a heavily suburban area, right? But from a management goal standpoint, you're going to need to consider whether inviting people into that space is going to have a heavy impact if people start to love it, right? So the challenge is, is to try to balance all the needs and preferences and come up with designs that are compatible with the need and the environment. So stakeholders. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone that's participated in this process so far with us and with the town. Um, this type of work uh, is important because stakeholders are partners in this work, right? So stakeholders can help identify user needs and preferences. They bring knowledge to the table from relevant work that they've done. They promote project awareness. So that's huge for getting the word out and helping uh, people know that this is a public process. It's an input process in order to be involved. Um, and they bring volunteer capacity. And it's not always just hand tools, it's fundraising, it's new relationships, it's a variety of different ways in order to increase 
the effective reach of this project in order to make sure that it's the best fit for everybody. Uh, stakeholders can also include the Chamber of Commerce, local tourism organizations, health advocates, grant makers, corporate sponsors, philanthropists, and many, many more. So you're seeing Penfield schools who can benefit from the programming of the new, uh, from programming opportunities on the new facilities. That could be the PE classes. It could be the cross country team, the cross country ski team. There's Rochester Youth Cycling Coalition and Roots that are listed here. They are two very popular youth cycling organizations that are doing amazing things in the community, creating gateway opportunities for kids to get into the sport and culture of off-road cycling. They're vibrant and effective, and they are changing lives to set kids up for these lifelong uh, relationships with cycling. Um, you've got Genesee at Regional Off-Road Cyclists here local advocacy and stewardship group, uh, West Seneca Bikes, who's done am amazing things in the Buffalo area to bring cycling infrastructure. There's a beautiful pump track that's there as a result of their work. Rochester Accessible Adventures, folks who advocate for people with disabilities and they do incredible programming, which could be done on the new trail-based facilities at Shadow Pines as well. And then you got local bike shops that are gonna stimulate the local economy support people with active and healthy lifestyles. We've got to support local shops. Super important. So anyway, stakeholders, they're great. <laughs> Survey results. So this is where it gets kind of fun. So there's a picture from last time. Uh, we've had 80 respondents from the in-person boards, which are shown at the back of the room. I did a tally on each of those. So the orange markings were from people's input, and then the black uh, circled numbers, that's the tally for those individual boards. The online survey, we had 422 respondents to date, and that brings us up to a total of 502 respondents total, likely some overlap uh, with the in-person and the on online. The survey will run until mid to late March, so please, um, it is mountain biking focused, but it is open to all different trail users to help illustrate their preferences and the types of experiences they're looking for. Um, and then thank you to the stakeholder groups for the support in circulating that survey. And again, another um, benefit of those stakeholder relationships in order to help advance our collective work. So, survey results. I strongly identify with being considered A, and about 80% of the respondents were mountain bikers, and then next behind that you had hikers and walkers. The shared use trail systems locally that people enjoy the most, uh, you can see that around Quai Bay Park West is leading the charge, but right behind it you've got the Dryer Road Park trails. Both of those were um, co-created uh, with local municipalities with Genesee Regional Off-Road Cyclists, a volunteer advocacy, at the volunteer advocacy and stewardship group that I referenced. And then 13%, the next number, I'll get Tryon behind that, but adjacent to the Dryer Road Park one, the Dryer Road Park uh, jumps and trails, or jumps and pump track, were singled out just to try to identify whether people were going for more of that stunt end of the spectrum or more the adventure trail riding kind of end of the spectrum. So we got a lot of people responding that they were looking for those types of experiences and it's important to kind of break that out. So between Bay Park West and Dryer Road Park as a whole, we got about 65% of the respondents saying that that's what they enjoy the most locally. So what are people looking for? Leading the charge, we got physical fitness was the top one that people identified. And then behind that, there's flow, right? So however people find that sense of flow, it's the next one that people are craving. And then behind that, whatever level people are riding at, they generally want to progress. They wanna get out there and maybe take that next step. So skills and progression was definitely high on the list. Uh, Nature was also high, technical challenge, adventure, very high. People want to get out and, and just explore the natural world, and trails are a great low-impact way of providing that access and the experiences of the different trail types. So I want more trails that look like. Here's what they look like. <laughs> Option one, 
Uh, option three was the number one. So it's, uh, it's what's considered a gateway flow, flow trail opportunity. It's a lower on the difficulty end of the spectrum uh, trail. It's a, an easier trail type. It's, it's kind of sinuous in nature. It features in-slope turns, large wide, large wide uh, turning radii, and this one in particular is adaptive accessible, so folks riding adaptive bikes uh, have ridden this and really enjoyed it. This is located out at Dryer Road Park. This trail is called Hog Hollow. It was built in conjunction with Genesee Regional Off-Road Cyclists a couple years ago. So option two, uh, or option five, was the second a ranked one. This is a trail called Blue Jay. It's a flow and jump trail, an int uh, intermediate level, so, um, sort of more difficult level, uh, intermediate rider level. A blue Trail, it's in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, this was machine built with Imba Trail Solutions, and I was on the team that helped work on this one. It's extremely, extremely popular, and it's very fun. So, but it's like a nice progression from option three to option five. And then option four is located down in Georgia. This is a trail called Lonely Hunter, and it features a number of uh, features like this. They're natural stone features that are built into the contours of the trail to provide a little bit of play on an adventurous, generally adventurous format trail. So local trails would benefit most from more diverse trails. So there's that sort of need for the next thing from a lot of people. So they've got a lot of options locally. Uh, what don't we have? So traditionally, as I was suggesting, a lot of the trails have been built by volunteers with hand tools. And there's a certain capacity that's achievable with that sort of work. But then once you start to mix in other, other types of efforts, you bring in machines, you bring in professional contractors, you can do work in collaborative ways like we did with um, Grok for the Hog Hollow project. Uh, incidentally, there is a new trail out at Dryer Road Park now called Rufus, which is sort of a step up from, from that trail, which is being extremely well received, very, very popular. Um, so more skills features in order to enable that, that progression or sense of play. Um, all weather trails ranked really high. So we do live in, a, in an environment where it's challenging to get out on trails this time of year. You have a lot of freeze thaw. So things can be done, like uh, aggregate can be used to harden trails in lieu of a paved service, surface so that you get more of a natural kind of trail experience. So it doesn't have to go one way or the other. It doesn't have to be narrow hand cut, and it doesn't have to be a paved asphalt or concrete sidewalk. There are a lot of different in-betweens that you can do. You can do the excuse me, the stone pavering, the flat stone pavering that I suggested that we saw in Arkansas. That's another technique for hardening across drainages and a way to um, make those more envir environmentally sustainable and just enjoyable kind of more year round. So lots of different opportunities and within the recommendations there will be a broad spectrum of, of trail types but also trail surfaces in order to make sure that the trails are going to be more enjoyable, more year of the year round. Um, so the project goals, the updated project goals include offering healthy trail-based recreation experiences for a variety of users, and the project focused objectives could look like a shared use network of diverse trails, mountain bike specific trail options, options and trails, and footpath primary trails. So even though they're shared use, they could be skewed to be more foot trail specific. And you can do that with design to limit trail speeds. Maybe it's tighter radius corners. Maybe it's narrower footprint, uh, keeping the trees in tighter. Trails can be shared, but they can also be footpath primary. So support mountain biking skills progression for all ability levels. Project focus objectives that could support that goal include a mountain bike park with hard surface pump track, technical skills features, drops, balance features, rock gardens, et cetera, and flow trails or jump lines. So goal three, 
promote community accessibility and positive site and social interaction. So project focused objectives that could support that one include adaptive friendly access points and trails, a trail system or a system of trailhead wayfinding and educational signage to make sure people have their bearings but also get the maximum benefit of what they're seeing or maybe skills instruction, that kind of stuff. Trail, trail related amenities such as parking, benches, shade shelters, picnic tables and observation decks. These are things that could be uh, included into the ecosystem of the trail network in order to support people's positive experiences. And then goal four, cultivate community relationships to support trail development and maintenance. As I was suggesting before, it's not just about um, the traditional methods, but when we work together in partnership to develop new infrastructure and grander ideas, people are gonna be writing grants or creating other kinds of funding relationships. Um, so new relationships to support project funding, partnering with stakeholder groups to provide volunteer capacity, and, and, it, and it could be in the traditional ways or it could be in new ways like we're seeing during this process. So existing conditions. So this is the process in order to do the assessment. We collect GIS data. That data is collected and compiled and then custom maps are created from that data to then do some desktop analysis, but then also the field work that's required. So the GPS based apps that we use are seen to the right here. I keep trying to figure out whether it's right or left for you folks. Um, one is called OnX, and it helps uh, GPS reference where we are in the property, helps identify adjacent parcels and who the ownership of that is, just to make sure that we're where we think we are. And then this uh, app on the far right here, that's Avenza, and that's using a custom created map. And what you see there is it's collecting data GPS tracks, waypoints, um, measuring areas and distances, and the callouts that you see there from the certain waypoints include noting notable points of interest. Uh, it identifies wet conditions. Uh, it might include uh, potential for bike park areas, that sort of stuff. Um, the data is then collected, it's analyzed. And during this process, we also did a number of stakeholder visits. So it was six walks in total. Uh, one was with the town and a number of were with the different groups that I mentioned earlier. And all of that was combined with phone conversations and in-person interviews in order to get to some of the observations. So this was primarily focused on the south end. So the last consultants identified an area within the south end um, for the health of the trail system and to explore all of the potential. We looked at the whole south end of the site just to make sure that um, that, that recommendation was sound. And what was, what was observed is it's a heavily active park, a lot of people in there, uh, especially when the sun's out. Um, you got a couple here walking their dogs and um, it can be challenging to balance all of the different preferences. So you see they're walking their dogs off leash You've got some um, sediment that's settled at the bottom of the paved trail down there, creating muddy conditions. So all of this can lead to user conflict. So the goal with the trail development work is to help mitigate and reduce user conflict as much as possible through, like I said, positive design recommendations and infrastructure. Um, but lots of dog walkers on and off leash, cyclists, runners, and it is a former golf course. I don't know if you all knew that, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's heavily touched, right? So it's heavily modified landscape. There are efforts being done to restore it to a more natural setting, which is beautiful. So it's being converted from a, a golf course more into parkland, right? So it's not exactly a nature preserve, but there are some spaces worth um, enhancing and protecting and that can also be done through good design. So the, the benef there are definitely some benefits to it being heavily touched and there's some challenges to that. So predominantly it's cleared land with lightly wooded areas and a couple more densely air, uh, wooded areas. Those total about 10 to 12 acres. So 
The points of interest include mature woods, the bridges that are in there, the creek, there's a cascade on the creek, there's a bluff that overlooks the creek, and there are a number of just really nice meadow views, especially when the sun's out. Uh, the existing golf cart paths, they were not designed as trails. Um, there's some very steep grades, like the one you're looking at in the upper picture. This one happens to go down to a 180 degree cor blind corner. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the grades are very steep. There are limited sight lines in some areas, like this instance. And a lot of the cart paths are on flat. They're away from the points of interest. They were meant to service the holes, and they don't particularly showcase the beauty of the landscape. Uh, the cart paths are made of asphalt, and even though the material is durable, it will ultimately age out, and decisions will be, need to be made at that point whether or not to resurface that asphalt, which will be a costly endeavor. And the the previous consultant did uh, recommend a series of mode XC paths, and those are serving for connectivity within the network now. They're doing a great job, but in this seasonal time of year, they're getting kind of muddy. They don't drain particularly well with the absence of trees and the cleared fairways. They're not soaking up a lot of water, and there's a lot of standing water on the lower angle grades out there. So in order to... Um, look more closely at the property, we did a slope analysis, and that slope analysis revealed what's probably pretty obvious to everybody. The terrain's generally suggestive of easier or green level trail, uh, with some possibilities for more difficult or blue level trail. And then there's a few instances where we could do some black level trail, but they're probably gonna be more in the bike park type of context. For a trail density study, we did some conceptual alignments that we reviewed with the town. And the way that looks is it looks like maybe about three to three and a half miles of easier green trail, um, about a mile to a mile and a half of the more difficult blue trail. And, and like I said, the bike park stuff would be where most of the black stuff is found. So here it is in kind of a zone focused area looking at potential difficulty areas based on the steepness of the relative grades. So that gets us to potential recommendations. So the rolling contours, they're great for trails. They're generally good for drainage. Like I said, there's some, there's some issues right now with saturated fairways and stuff. Um, it is hard to put trail on open grassy areas. They're not as sustainable because the grass wants to come in. There's not a lot of canopy protecting the trail from overhead rains and that sort of stuff which displaces soil. Um, there are changes in elevation, but they're relatively minimal. They don't, unfortunately, support a lot of longer gravity experiences, but it would be possible to do things in that, like I said, the bike park context, which would be really compelling for people and innovative and different than what's found locally in the existing trail infrastructure. There are limited opportunities for narrower traditional type of hand-built trail, but enough for some shorter segments, probably looking at maybe about a mile in total, a quarter mile here, a quarter mile there, half mile there. Um, trying to reduce the number of intersections would give people the, that adventurous, sort of more nature immersion kind of feel that they're going for. So that's a possibility. Um, and then there are ample opportunities for adaptive friendly all weather trail. The, the image that you see on the bottom there is from West Hill down in Naples, a construction project that was done with the Nature Conservancy this past fall. Um, that trail's not quite yet open to the public. It'll be done so in the spring, but you can see there was aggregate that was brought in to cap the trail, and that trail will evolve in, in more of a rustic way than, let's say, the canal path or typical stone dust trail. So other opportunities, um, there are lots of opportunities for alternate lines and technical trail features, maybe during the length of a certain trail for a differentiated trail experience, more of a choose your own adventure kind of thing. And I'm talking about maybe like skinnies and balance features that would be parallel with the trail. Um, there are opportunities to better showcase the landscape. Um, so. This up top, you've got one of the, cas the cascade that's along the creek that could be enhanced a little bit and made to be a more attractive um, viewing opportunity. Um, there are opportunities uh, with the pre-cleared and pre-graded 
gentle slopes that are really excellent potential for bike park type amenities, skills features, pump track, and flow and jump lines like you see down in this lower picture. And that lower picture is uh, Cliff's Bike Park in Cleveland. So great case study for some really nice work that's been done. I know Robert's been down there. It's very high quality and great for all ages and all ability levels. Um, it's a safe, uh, really inviting social landscape. Um, and then there's more, more potential to continue mowing those XC alignments, knowing that they don't do great during these winter months, but they do provide really wonderful connectivity and places for more meadow type walks. Oh, and like high school cross country and skiing and that sort of stuff. So uh, in terms of experience zones, when we're looking at experience-based recreation, uh, in the far western side of the property where all the hemlocks are, that might be where the trail development that's focused on nature enjoyment goes. Like I talked about reducing trail speeds, making sure that everybody feels comfortable and they have a chance to access that space maybe with a, a very, very light touch to it. Um, down at the very bottom would be maybe where the mountain bike optimized type of trail is. It would be something where we could use some of the elevation changes in there or the bluff edge to create uh, more of a single track type of experience that would be uh, span the sort of old school, new school kind of flavor. Um, the entire site of the south end could be used for connectivity, for gateway type of trail experiences, for adaptive accessibility experiences, for all weather type of trail connectivity. And then in orange, you've got the bike park stuff and skills types of trail skills features that could go along with other types of trails. So let's say there was a loop in this area that uh, was an all-weather loop parallel with that breaking off and then reconverging at certain intervals. You might have some skills features for balance features, um, other types of differentiated things to go along. So if you're out with your family and, and want an opportunity to, to ride something parallel, then you could reconverge and do that sort of stuff. So I've also got the current trailhead, but there's a, a nice parking facility that could be expanded um, to the eastern, northeastern side of the property that could serve as a new trailhead for the system. But again, all this is uh, up for consideration and exploration. Next steps. So we've got some conceptual design development work to do to get in a little tight, as I said, you know, we did some conceptual alignments. They're not ready for public consumption. They were more for assessing trail density and um, initial network configurations, but we're gonna get a little bit more into that and love to explore any of those possibilities with you all. Um, and then there's gonna be some field design and layout work that's necessary to identify trail corridors for development. We're gonna develop the report and the corresponding maps uh, there will be a presentation of that draft report, and then we'll receive and incorporate the feedback and finalize that into the conceptual master plan. The next meeting date is to be determined, but it'll be sometime in May when we're ready to present this report. Um, and the survey runs until mid-March. So going forward, uh, your opportunities for participation are to invite people to submit uh, responses for that survey to foster the project awareness and support it in any ways that they're interested um, to come for the comment period of the draft report and to review the final report when it's ready so thank you if anybody has any questions I'll be in the back and look forward to speaking thank you Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's a little long, but <laughs> a lot a to get through. There. All right, so thank you uh, to all of our presenters. Um, like I said, it's now time for a breakout session where we will have plan architecture with a rec center study if you'd like to review things a little bit more sp specific and closely uh, and converse with them with any questions or comments. Uh, we've got Shadow Pines uh, mountain bike project uh, over in the back over there with Adam and further trails. And then our entire rec and master plan update committee will be up front just for uh, general conversations, um, any input that you'd like for the master plan. Um, so again, 
take the survey, uh, come and talk to us uh, today. Um, but after this, like Adam said, uh, if you are able to take the surveys and there's things in there that uh, you'd like to comment on, uh, the best opportunity would be to reach out uh, via email to recreation at penfield.org. Uh, that'll come to the rec department and the rec department and myself will choose to send it to the different groups uh, as they continue um, to put all of this feedback into their presentations. But again, can't stress enough, community input, community involvement is what we're looking for. So thank you for being here. Look forward to future discussions for all of this stuff. Thank you.